Okay, I know people are still making their way in, but we also want to uh, honor our time commitment and try to finish on time tonight. So I'll start to get things started, and as people make their way in, uh, I'll help people find a seat. We're only going to be seated for a little bit here at the beginning, and then we're breaking into groups, and we'll continue doing what you're doing right now, which is talking to each other. Um, but we did want to set a little context. Uh, my name is David Driscoll. I'm serving as Interim Housing Director for the city, and I want to start off by thanking you for being here tonight on a beautiful summer day in January. Um, I, I know it's, uh, you've got a lot of other things you could be doing. We want to make the best use of this time as possible for you. Um, tonight is an a important step in an, a, an important conversation for our community, which is about housing and why does housing matter and what are the things we should be doing, not just as a city in terms of policy, but as a community in terms of addressing some of our housing challenges. This isn't a new conversation. It's been around for a while. We're going to see a little bit of a video here that talks, uh, has some historic images of people talking about housing here in Boulder. Uh, we've done things in the past. We've put policies into place. We have our inclusionary housing program, which requires a percentage of new housing development be permanently affordable uh, to people who are lower moderate income. We run that housing program at the city. We work with a lot of different partners to make that housing happen, and we leverage a lot of other public funds and private funds to do it. We have some charts on the side here that give you a little bit of an idea of what's happened as a result of that. We've created well over 3,200 uh, permanently affordable units here in our city, uh, renter units and owner units. Um, we are the community we are today in part because of those programs. And the conversation we're having today is about what kind of community do we want to be in the future and what are the things we could be doing that maybe we aren't yet that could help us be that. Um, it may be that we come to the conclusion we're doing everything we can and, and we'll, that we'll just keep doing it. Uh, but we're hoping that maybe there are some creative ideas of things we could do uh, above and beyond what we're doing already that would make a difference that would be consistent with our community's values in, in shaping our community into the future. Uh, there are some things we know for sure. We're not going to solve the affordable housing challenge. It's just not possible. This will be a challenge we continue to face. Uh, but every generation, we're going to have to figure out what are the, what's the next step, what are the things we can do. I don't know if anyone saw the New York Times today. There was an article about the middles being lost around the country in terms of middle class. Uh, people are finding it harder. Some people are doing really well with the economic recovery, and others are, are slipping further behind. So our discussion here about maintaining the middle, losing our middle class is not unique to Boulder. Uh, it's a challenge being faced. Our challenge is, is there anything we want to do in response to that or should do? Um, there's other things that are happening. We're, we're living longer. Uh, we're older as a community. That creates a new set of housing challenges that actually creates a demand for a type of housing that we've actually never built before. So what does that mean? And one of the goal areas we'll talk about is called aging in place, the idea that as you live older, is there, are there places in our community for you to find the housing that meets your needs? I think each of us can think of our lifespan so far, and we've lived in a lot of different types of housing from the time we were a child through college, through being a young family or a young person in the workforce. So thinking about housing is, is, a, is a challenging conversation because it's easy to fall into a numbers thing about numbers of units for income of X sort. But it's a, it's a conversation about community. It's about creating a quality of a place a place to call home, uh, creating diversity. We talk a lot about inclusiveness. Um, that's not to say that we're going to include in Boulder everyone who wants to live here or everyone who currently commutes to work here. We did some uh, survey work actually talking to in commuters. There's plenty of them who actually don't want to live here. Um, they've found a place that works for them, for their, for their family. Their spouse might work in another community in the metro area. They're living in between. Um, or they just want to be in a, a bigger house with a bigger yard. Um, that's OK. Our, our challenge is what kind of community do we want to be and what are the kinds of policies we should do as a city and what kinds of partnerships uh, should we be having. So I'm not here to talk to you about a lot of things, though. I want to get started by uh, showing a brief video, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the process that we're in for this conversation and, and how we've structured tonight, which is really about you talking to each other uh, about the challenges and, uh, that we're facing as a community. And, hopefully generating some, starting to create some uh, great ideas about what we could do moving forward. So with that, I'm going to kick it off with a, a little video uh, by the BBC. Um, maybe some of you have seen it already. We 
doesn't take very long to go from Boulder into nature. And that's really the whole point. This is part of what makes Boulder, Boulder. A progressive, creative town. I can bike five minutes away and get to my favorite hiking trail. Great weather, even throughout the winter time. Very cool, small town mountain feel. So why is it that even in Boulder, people are being confronted with some really tough questions? More, 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 and denser, denser, denser. There's a slide towards being just a rich white town. How do we keep your janitors, your plumbers, your uh, people like that in the city so that we are a diverse community? Boulder was a hippie destination in the 1960s. And if we're talking culturally, the vibe here still reflects the past. More recently, it's been a tech and business boom taking place. And that's changed things. Boulder is now one of the worst U.S. cities for income inequality. More than a third of the population makes over $100,000. This film is about a universal problem, how to make the future livable. Here in Boulder, Colorado, citizens themselves have decided the answer is to limit their city's growth. Four decades later, the BBC is back, and the story is still pretty much the same. As Boulder's popularity grows, it can't really physically grow. This is the land around Boulder the city has purchased over the years to keep preserved. It's called open space, about 45,000 acres at this point. Because we've constrained the amount of land that you can actually build on uh, by purchasing the open space, that combined with the desirability of living in Boulder created um, a, a housing for very low income and, and we have housing that's resulting from market forces at the very high level, but the middle is hollowed out. So welcome, this is my little kitchen here. Cecily is feeling that middle class squeeze. She's a nurse and she's been able to stay in Boulder because of her subsidized housing. But she'll lose that housing help if her salary goes up any further. I've finally gotten to this point where my head is above the waterline. If I were to have to then leave here out of Boulder or into the market rate, once again, the waterline would be really high. Um, I do not want to have to leave. So just why might Cecily have to go? Take a look at the number of affordable rental properties, which have dropped by nearly two thirds in the past decade. Plus, it's estimated that in just five years, five years, people making under $60,000 a year won't be able to afford a place to live. One alternative is to break the law. <laughs> Christina lives with nine other people in a co-op. It's a lifestyle, but also a necessity. More people, less rent. But technically, Boulder doesn't allow more than three or four unrelated people to live in a single house. I wouldn't be able to be here if I wasn't living in a space that was overoccupied. I love being able to be frugal and work for a small nonprofit doing something I really care about. And if that means that I can't afford to be here, maybe I can't be here. And that's sad. Boulder's options within its limited space really comes down to a choice of priorities. Do you make the city denser, but with more room for the middle class? Or, as some are asking, will that hurt Boulder's character? I've lived in Boulder for 30 years, and I came here because of that small town feel, and I'm very concerned that that's changing. I think that every real estate market has its own natural market dynamics, and I don't know that you can force affordability on all markets. I can't afford to buy a house in Telluride. I can't afford to buy a house in Malibu. And I don't know that that can be enforced. It's not particularly right or fair, but it is what happens sometimes. And in the end, maybe it all comes back to the land. The very thing that draws people to Boulder and protects their city. 
but also forces Bolderites to make some tough decisions about what kind of place they want to call home. Okay, so that's a bit of context for the discussion we're having tonight. I thought I'd get a little bit of context uh, for understanding who's in the room for the conversation. So I'm going to start off by everyone raise your hand if you've been in Boulder for five years or more. Now keep your hand up if you've been in Boulder for 10 years or more. Now keep your hand up for 15 years or more, 20 years or more, 25 years or more. The rest of you all to keep off. I won't go further, just so. <laughs> Don't want people doing the math, yeah. Um, and I thought I'd also just see in terms of geographic distribution, I'm not going to be able to name every neighborhood, but I'll do five areas, central, north, south, east, and northeast. So how many folks here from central Boulder? You define yourself, self-defined. Central Boulder, North Boulder, great. East Boulder, South Boulder, and Northeast Boulder, a gun barrel. Okay, good. So we've got some distribution. Um, and how many people here own their home? How many people are renting? And how many people are staying with Airbnb? <laughs> no. This was a catch, you'd, you'd have to leave, no. Um, no, so that's, uh, that's great. We have a, a nice uh, cross-section of folks here. Um, and I do want to encourage, this is a part of a conversation. It's not all happening tonight. Um, we have a number of different things we're doing to engage people in this conversation. I hope all of you who are here tonight will go home and encourage friends and neighbors to get involved. Uh, Housingboulder.net, not .org or .com, .net is the place to go to get information. We've loaded a lot of the reports we've done over the last year, studies on the market, uh, survey work we've done on that site. There's a, a webinar we did in November you can watch. This will be actually recorded and on there and hopefully everybody is comfortable with being video recorded tonight. That's what we're doing to help make this accessible to other folks. Um, one thing we're doing on this initiative, we're partnering with a group called Code for America and there's a woman in the room, Becky. Where are you? Becky, stand up and wave. Becky is here actually for seven months living with us in Boulder. She's uh, based in the San Francisco Bay Area. She, uh, it's Code for America is a national nonprofit that works with communities around a set of issues and they're working with us. They've done a lot of work on community engagement and thinking not just about online tools, correct, but other ways in which people get engaged in the community conversations and sort of changing the ways in which uh, government and, and neighborhoods and community talk to each other. So, if you have a chance, introduce yourself to Becky tonight. Uh, she'd love to hear from you, and uh, also she can tell you more about the work that they're going to be up to. And there's actually a, a, also a rep from the Boulder Brigade, who's a group of local folks who are connected to the Code for America network and will be doing some uh, work with Becky as well. Um, so after tonight, what we're going to be doing is um, we've got a set of working groups and a number of folks from working groups who are here with us tonight. If you're in a working group, can you raise your hand? So they're here tonight actually to be listeners um, and to hear from you. They're working on different goal areas that we have defined from council um, that I'll, I'll walk through in just a moment. But they're here to listen. So the working groups are going to be meeting. They're all public meetings if you want to go and listen in on the conversations they're having. And then we're leading up to um, what we're, I think we're calling it a rapid fire session. Uh, in early March, uh, which that is an opportunity for anybody in our community to come forward what they think is the coolest, grooviest idea they can think of for responding to our housing challenges. Every person gets a bit of time up on stage. Everyone in the audience gets to watch and have a clicker and say whether they think it's a great idea that we should think about some more or don't like it so much. Um, it's just, it's very rapid fire. It's to generate ideas and that's really the phase that we're in right now. We have a housing toolkit online that you'll see that it is a compendium of everything that we've thought about in the past and then some new ideas have been added to and we're hoping through this idea generation process to make sure we're not leaving anything out early on and then really it's about from that list what's the most appropriate for us we think as a community to get to work on and our hope is by the end of this process to come up with a strategy document that doesn't actually implement those ideas but says here's the top five things that we think we should be doing as a community to respond to our housing challenges um, so we'll go through a process there's two parts of that one is thinking are there things citywide or with our partners cu or boulder housing partners other nonprofits that 
we should be working together to do things. The other is a neighborhood specific conversation. So that'll be starting in about March, April. Opportunities for neighbors will be so hosting some events as the city and then an opportunity for neighbors to host their own events to think about what makes most sense for the area that you live in. Because the same thing isn't gonna work in Gun Barrel that might work downtown. So there's a lot of things that are gonna be going on. We're gonna do our best not to overload you but also make it accessible if you happen to be the person who gets up at, in the middle of the night and wants to send in your thoughts, you can do that. Uh, or if you prefer to come down and we'll help a lot of people be able to do sort of face-to-face -face interaction in the process. Um, so that's sort of the big picture tonight. We're going to be breaking into groups to talk around the goal categories. And, I, and there are goal statements that council adopted. They're kind of a, a holding place for some ideas about what we're trying to work on. Um, I'm not going to walk through each of the goal statements, but the categories are, and I'll, hopefully I'll remember them all, um, uh, meet our current commitments. So we have a 10%, our goal right now adopted by council 10, 12 years ago, I think, is to create 10% of our housing stock as being permanently affordable units for low and moderate income households. And the chart on, there, on the wall there shows us that we're about 7.2% of the way there to getting to 10%. Uh, and so there's a group that's thinking about, well, what could we do that's gonna help us move forward on that goal? We're doing inclusionary housing. Are there other things we could do to help meet the needs, particularly of lower income households in our community so they can be a part of our community in the future? An another group is a group called Maintain the Middle. And this is basically acknowledging that the middle income uh, bracket of households is eroding, not just in Boulder, like I said, but nationally. But are there things we could do in terms of thinking about the housing, types of housing that are being created that could make things that are attractive and affordable to middle income households? So that's that, the theme of that group. There's another group called Housing Choices. Uh, this is about thinking about the diversity of housing choices, thinking about different types of households, changing uh, lifestyles, changing demographics, um, and also thinking citywide as well as neighborhood specific, how are we making sure that there's a choice for everyone at wherever they are in their, their lifespan that makes sense for them, that they could find something that works for them here in our community. And so that's both housing type and housing affordability. Um, another group is called Aging in Place, a similar idea, but really thinking about that sort of later in the lifespan, how could we think about anything, whether changes in regulations or new housing types that would help to provide housing for people? They don't reach a point in their life where they say, there ain't nothing for me in Boulder, I have to leave now, I've, I've aged out of Boulder. Um, or I have to stay in this house that I don't really want to stay in because I can't find another place to move to. So that's aging in place. And then the fifth one is uh, strengthening partnerships. And like I said, uh, the city doesn't build housing. We, we partner with a lot of different groups, and there's a lot of groups out there that don't partner with us who build housing. Uh, but we um, use our affordable housing funds. We work with our nonprofit housing providers, sometimes with for-profit housing providers, CU, uh, Naropa. All these groups are creating housing in our community. What are the things that those partnerships could really focus on that would make a difference? So those are the five areas. And then we have the sixth bonus section, which is open forum. If you have things you want to say or you want to talk about that you don't think fit into any of those categories, um, I think this group right here is going to be that group. So we're going to break into groups. Obviously, there's a lot of people here, which is fantastic, but we're going to try to manage it. Um, if you find there's things you want to say tonight that you don't get a chance to in the small group discussions, one, you can write them down on paper and give them to a facilitator, and they'll be captured along with everything else. And two, go to housingboulder.net, and there's two things you can do. One, sign up on the email list, and two, connect to what's called Inspire Boulder, which is an on online town hall format where you can post your comments, see what other people have posted, respond to them. So there's other ways to give input because we're gonna do our best to manage this tonight, but it's gonna be challenging, but it's a good challenge to have. Okay, we're gonna try to get the report out so that we can get to the presentation from Mike Piatuk. So if you could give your attention to John here from Aging in Place. This is just snapshots from each of the groups so you can have a sense of some of the ideas that came out of the conversations. Okay, <clears throat> one of the main themes in Aging in Place is affordability. Um, as folks retire, uh, you know, there is a loss of income and uh, we talked somewhat about invisible seniors in the community and uh, really taking that into account. 
uh, coming up with a variety of solutions and understanding that as people age also come along with that care needs, which is another part of housing. So the main theme there, that first one is the affordability. The second main theme was flexibility and group living, uh, uh, dealing with zoning, with co-housing, neighborhood planning, cooperative housing, uh, and really focusing on code changes that allow for more flexibility to promote, promote those areas of affordability, accessibility, and all of those things. So two major themes out of our group. Great, thank you. Let's hear it for aging in place. Okay, so I'm looking for the other reporters. I'm just gonna trust that you actually were delegated by your group to report if you come on up. Here. So my name is Oriel Eisner. I was in the Strengthening Partnerships group and I'm also in the Strengthening Partnerships working group. Um, so we talked about what partnerships may exist, what partnerships should exist, and the three main new ideas that came up were looking at the regional um, discussion, looking at how the cities around us affect housing in Boulder, how we affect housing in those cities, and the commuting back and forth. So obviously associated with that is transportation. So the first one is looking at taking a regional perspective and also taking a transportation perspective and looking at partnerships. Um, the second piece had to do with what brings people to Boulder. Obviously there's a desirability that brings people to Boulder. People want to move here, but there's also organizations such as CU that bring people into Boulder. There's organizations such as large employers that bring people into Boulder and also federal employers that obviously bring people into Boulder. So looking at those types of groups and how they affect housing and what type of relationship we could have with them, what type of housing are they responsible to provide, what type of housing are they not responsible to provide, what can maybe help out with. And then the third piece was looking to neighborhoods as partners. Uh, neighborhoods obviously have different needs, different goals that they see, and different um, desires for the community. So looking at neighborhoods as partners to work with and partners to get input from. And then sort of underlying all three of those was looking at incentives and subsidies and how those may tie in to those various, um, various different groups. Can we get different subsidies from different organizations? Can we get different incentives to um, convince organizations to create certain types of housing rather than others? Um, but those were the, the three new ideas that came from our group. Great, thank you. What's up, we have a group coming up on stage. You want me to hold the paper for you? Yeah, I had to bring the paper because I couldn't see it from back there. Um, so we were talking about maintaining the middle um, and we had very similar themes that have already kind of come up, but issues around zoning, um, thinking about employers and not just um, if employers are making um, jobs that are very high income or middle income and how does that impact what kind of housing is available, but also the number of jobs, how many jobs are available for people in Boulder. Um, thinking about things with alternative housing like tiny houses and co-housing and co-ops and um, changing ordinances so that makes that actually work for people. Um, affordable housing options for middle class families and having um, middle class be able to get support and subsidies or loans or help to, to get started just like there's available for uh, low income families. Um, and then issues around transportation and creating communities that don't require you to have two or three cars in your home, things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Who's next? Yeah, come on up. I don't need a stage. Um, so we were talking about uh, strengthening our uh, current commitments and it was really focused on the low income or low to moderate income uh, population in Boulder. And three of um, the topics that we discussed were changes in occupancy definitions. So uh, things like co-ops and the amount of people that we allow um, in houses in different neighborhoods and how that can affect affordability for low income families and um, individuals. Uh, the second topic was uh, to continue and expand existing programs that help low-income people or low-income families uh, and individuals find their way into the housing market. So <clears throat> Boulder has programs that help people buy houses and just expanding and supporting those programs. Uh, the third topic that we talked about that's a major challenge and I know is a hot topic for a lot of people is the scarcity or scarcity of land and what do we do about this? So you know, density and where do we put affordable housing and what does that look like? And since we are landlocked, um, you know, we can't go out forever. So what other options do we have for putting more affordable housing in Boulder? Great. Others, I know there are more groups. Yeah, Ram. 
Well, we had an active discussion, went up to the very last moment, therefore I'm the default reporter, um, <laughs> city staff. But we had a fair amount of conversation about the importance of context and communicating with the neighborhood, neighborhood being partners in whatever we do, so a lot of process discussion. We then also had discussion about a variety of different kinds of units, uh, whether those be tiny houses, ADUs, um, ADOs, uh, live work, et cetera. So having a greater variety in terms of what we offer on a given parcel. And then finally, a fair amount of discussion about both the need for the city to show more flexibility, examples of things that don't work in PUDs and co-ops, et cetera, uh, but then also concern about managing mitigating impacts like parking. So we need to be more flexible, but we also need to have more uh, performance-based enforcement so that you don't have impacts. Thank you. Over here. So the other maintain the middle group, and I was the facilitator, Susan, and got volunteered to report. So on the challenges, um, the increasing housing prices in the community and land values is really the challenge everybody acknowledged to trying to maintain the middle, and that um, we really couldn't provide housing for everybody who would like to be here. And I think there was a lot of consensus on that discussion around that in both groups. And then in terms of some of the ideas, lots of ideas around really an ethic where um, there are a lot of opportunities for other types of housing products that maybe are smaller and um, maybe tiny houses was one that came up, townhomes came up, some of the ideas the Landmarks Board has put out for how you might also actually preserve existing housing and also uh, maintain the affordability of some of the current housing in the community. And then there was also the acknowledgement very much um, similar to what Randall was just talking about of we need to do it in a way that we also address the impacts and that it's done in a context sensitive way and that there's respect for existing neighborhoods. So it has to be done in terms of the right places and in the right way. So, but lots of specific options. Great, Great. yeah. All right, you're getting a full dose of city staff here. Um, also default facilitator, becoming the reporter. Three main themes, nothing too new from what you've already heard. One is the need to be really more nuanced about thinking about density. Is it really about impacts? Is it about numbers? Is it about environmental uh, concerns that we might have? Also geographically, what does it mean? Different things in different places are appropriate. Second, a lot of interest in talking about and exploring occupancy, uh, not just as limits, but the numbers of people that are living in the housing that we do have as a way of having more creative housing options. And the third main theme was really, we need to be very creative. If we're gonna have more options, it's gonna take more creativity than we've shown so far, so. Great, I haven't been keeping track of the number. Have we heard from everybody? Is there a group that hasn't reported? Open forum. Open forum. Right. Uh, we'll be back with you in a half hour. No. Okay, so uh, we were definitely the sort of the grab bag topics that didn't fall into other things, although I heard a lot of common themes from some of the other groups that reported out. So um, there were many topics. The top three that um, we highlighted are um, neighborhood planning and the need to uh, work with neighborhoods to do some bottom up planning and acknowledge that different places are different in the community and there's a lot of diversity and one size does not fit all. We had quite a bit of conversation on um, both sides of the issue of that. Uh, we talked a fair amount about the need to acknowledge and recognize the jobs in housing imbalance issue as part of this conversation. Um, and then the third topic was the recognition that transportation is also part of the solution and that mass transit and eco passes and such tools like that are something that um, is part of the solution as well. So. Okay, great. So we are going to be capturing all of this input um, that's on the boards, or if, if there are things that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say, you, like I told you, you can either write them down on a piece of paper and give them to one of the facilitators and it'll be captured along with everything else. Um, and then there's the online forum. But we'll be uh, summarizing all this. It'll be on the website. I also want to highlight that each of the working groups, their sessions are also summarized on the website. So housingboulder.net is the place to go. Uh, you can sign up to be on the email list so you make sure you know what's going on as, as things progress in this process. Um, and you can access a, a lot of the different documents and the online 
forum. Hopefully some of you had the chance to talk to Becky too to share your thoughts about the work of uh, Code for America and creating better tools for us for engagement. I am now going to introduce our speaker, and we, I forgot to say at the beginning, we, we decided we'd flip things a little bit from what might be the traditional format for this kind of an event. Rather than start with the keynote and then sort of spend the evening responding to what he said, actually for him to respond a bit to what you said. Obviously his presentation he did before he heard what you said tonight. Uh, so he'll be talking about his experience working in communities. Uh, most of his work's been on the, on the West Coast. Come on up, Mike. Um, Mike is uh, award-winning architect, I believe that's accurate, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. His life work has been focused on affordable housing and particularly doing participatory design approaches with communities to figure out how to respond to affordable housing needs in communities in a way that fits with other community values. So we thought he might be an appropriate person to share some thoughts. So he'll be reflecting things he's heard here that maybe he's heard in other places and just some examples of working with communities don't freak out about the images he's showing. He's not here to sell you a product. He's here to share some experiences and just be part of the conversation. But we thought it'd be nice to have an outside perspective. I know we're running behind schedule a little bit. If you have to leave at eight, we will not hold it against you. Just uh, please leave quietly. The entire presentation, the whole evening is being recorded, videotaped, it'll be available online. So you could catch the last part if you have to leave before Mike's done. But we, uh, we're running a little bit late. We have a great turnout, which is a good reason to be late. But. Mike, come on up. You want to hold it or you want to put it yeah, down? I guess I should put my water down someplace level. I can't yeah. put it on the podium. How about I just pass it on to you? Um, good evening, folks. Quite frankly, I am um, very honored to be here and now very humbled. Uh, having heard all the conversation this evening, this is a very bright audience, very smart and very progressive. Uh, by anybody's measure around the country. Um, and, and so I hope whatever it is that I am going to chat with you about tonight is, is helpful. Um, you seem to have a lot of the, your answers already built in to your thoughts about uh, what it's been like living in, in Boulder for all the years that you have. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, just by uh, you know reasons of full disclosure, I have for the past 30, Seven years have been living in Oakland, California. Uh, before that, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, lived 22 years there. Anybody? Brooklyn? I heard, Bro yeah, there you go, there you go, okay. Any other Brooklynites? I should have started with that. There you go. All right, Lanceman. I feel at home. <laughs> and about 10 years in between those two stints and in other cities, and did spend four years when I was teaching at Penn State in a, a college town. Uh, uh, College Park, Pennsylvania, and a year in Helsinki. So they've been mostly urban experiences. So I, I hope I'm not a piece of urban soot that's blown into town tonight. <laughs> and I, I will try not to uh, offend you. Now let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, cozy by design. I never use the D word anymore because density often comes up from the word dense, and dense is often used unfairly on people. Um, <laughs> And I just don't like the sound of it. I've been to many places that have lots of people in a little amount of space, and they're wonderful people, and I call those places cozy. So I talk about communities as, as to their level of coziness and how much coziness they're willing to, to tolerate. <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through a series of places, and I actually took some out because I thought you'd really get offended, especially if I brought up Brooklyn. Um, so I, I took it out of the slide talk <laughs> uh, this afternoon. Uh, let's see if I can make this go forward. Am I doing that? No. Okay, why is it not? Ah, okay. Levels of coziness. Um, it's very easy to, to get at least a quick view by just taking the land area of any community and dividing it into the numbers of people who live in that community. And you can see the uh, younger Western cities have uh, pretty low quotients of, of, of coziness. Uh, and as you get uh, further up the line, the older cities, well, they're way up there. But Boulder is in there at 4170, a square mile of your land area. I, I left out the water. Just of the land area that could be uh, occupied. And, and actually, it, and if you really look at the residential areas of any city, only about 30% of the city's area is actually residential because you've got to subtract out all the streets, 
schools, churches, other land uses, parks. So only about 30% is occupied. So the level of coziness in these cities is often more than, than what you see in those numbers. Um, and that quick look internationally, it was kind of intriguing to see, well, where does Boulder fit at 4,100 per square mile? And you got Le London 11,000, Paris at 64,000, which is about the same as Manhattan. Manhattan's about 65,000. And then, of course, the Asian cities. I took out Kowloon as an example there with 154,000. So it all depends on where you grow up and what your willingness to be cozy um, many of us in the room would probably not be able to do 154,000, uh, but having lived at 37,000 uh, a square mile, I'm, I'm quite comfortable in, in, in these cities. Uh, this thing seems to move forward without even trying now. Um, yeah, so there's Boulder. You've got 103,000 people, and you're on 25 square miles. So I thought it, I, I would look at some other uh, college towns. Uh, just to try to make a comparison. There's Berkeley with about only 10 and a half square miles and 115,000 people. Berkeley's a pretty nice town by most people's standards. If you come from the East Coast and you come to Berkeley, you think you've been in, you're, you're in Nirvana. Uh, and, and yet their level of coziness is uh, considerably higher than, than Boulder. And then if you look at Cambridge, you know, the heart of Harvard and MIT land, They've got 105,000 people, about the same as Boulder, but in one quarter of the area, 6.4 square miles. And Cambridge is a pretty nice town. When you go to visit Cambridge, it seems like a pretty comfortable place. It's a sweet, charming uh, village. So it's all relative, you know, what you've, what you've come from and what you're used to. Um, and so I kind of put them all up there together and see the coziness quotients in there. And, the median family incomes was a real surprise. The median family income in Boulder is higher than Cambridge. And the median price home is a little bit less. Um, but I suppose um, you guys might think differently. And if you look at the average price home, it's, it's even larger. The rate of poverty is, is difficult to measure in all those towns because of the pop student population. So I never know what I'm really looking at when I see these from the Census Bureau. And the income levels, uh, or the incomes being earned by men in, in these towns is, is quite uh, different. But it was even more surprising for women because in Berkeley and in Cambridge, the women were earning 85 to 88 percent of what men were earning. But here in Boulder, it's only 66 percent. So you got some work to do. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. Uh, I, just, I just hold this and it goes. So then I thought, well, maybe, maybe Portland's another example, because they're, I think, the only other community in the country that's really built a, 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 um, a growth boundary, had the, the courage to do that. And, um, well, it's, it's a much bigger, bigger town, and it has a lot more area. <clears throat> but it's interesting that its coziness is factor is only about 10% more than Boulder. Um, and sales prices, of course, are, are much higher. Took the average sales price now, not the median, but the average in, in Boulder is uh, almost three times what it is in Portland. And that's what I heard a lot about uh, tonight. Uh, it's becoming a, a, a land of the privilege. Where did you get that number? Because that's been stuck in significant ways. Uh, where? In. Oh, I got that off the web and some of these uh, sites that deal with uh, national figures for different cities. Yeah, the median is lower. The median, as you saw from the previous slide, was somewhere around 400, 500,000. This was an average. But you guys know better. This is, you know, go tell the web. <laughs> um, here's another important thing. 21 cities, metropolitan regions, were studied as to their transportation costs. And it was really a quite uh, amazing story because the people who are in the bottom third, economically speaking, uh, they're spending a considerable amount more just to move their bodies through space. And, and transportation is really part of a housing cost. It's not a separate expense. Where you choose to live, it's going to mean whether or not you need to own a car. I mean, growing up in Brooklyn, I never had a car. I didn't learn to drive until I was 25. My wife taught me how to drive. Because I had subways and buses. It was a great life. And then I came to California, and now I have to have a car. But what's interesting about this is who lives where for the lower income folks, if they're living in the center of the city, whoop, now I have that happening. 
How do you make them go back? Oh, God. This thing is really sensitive. Yeah, can you control it back there? Because this thing seems uh, sensitive. I just look at it and it changes. So if you live in the center of town and you're uh, in the bottom third economically, your housing and transportation costs are 54% of your income. So you've got less than half for all the other ingredients in life. But if you have been forced out to the edge, 66% now, because you're going to have to be spending a lot more on your car. And if you're really on the edge of town or outside of town, your commute is even greater. And, 70, and, and across those 21 metropolitan regions, it was found that people at that income level were spending 70% of their income for their roof over their head and the ability to move their bodies through space. <clears throat> so the more that we can get folks of modest means to be living in the heart of town, close to the places of work, the better chance they have to survive and uh, be part of the American dream of becoming openly mobile. Just as an aside, I came from a welfare family. A uh, single mother raised two sons on, on welfare for the first six years and then worked on minimum wage for a dollar an hour back in those days in the 40s, 50s. And somehow we made it. We lived in the same one-room tenement in Brooklyn for 22 years until I went on to Harvard and my brother went on to Columbia. So it was possible in those days to be upwardly mobile from the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. It ain't so anymore. In fact, we're among the lowest in upward mobility of, uh, of any of the developed uh, countries. In fact, if you really want the American dream of, what, of that upward mobility, you have to move to Canada because they're much better at it than we are. So we can go to the next. <clears throat> Another interesting thing about these higher levels of coziness, the Sierra Club has done some interesting you know, studies about water use, these lower densities of three per acre, and as they go up into higher levels of coziness, you're using less and less water because you've got less and less land to take care of. And the local shopping increases because you've got more people to support local business. It's all very obvious stuff, but they were able to find ways of putting numbers on it. This was a, a study of, uh, of Phoenix. The transit service, of course, goes way up too as you've got more people living more cozily. Um, in this particular case, you get 143 bus stops within walking distance, or, or I should say buses per hour within walking distance of your, of your home. Gasoline, of course, the consumption goes way down. And the pollution, in this case nitrogen oxide, per household per year goes, goes way down. So there are a lot of environmental be benefits out of living a bit more cozily. So, so what do these different levels of coziness look like? I've spent the 47 years now of my career working with lower income neighborhoods, helping them plan their futures so that they have the same chance that I had, quite frankly. I didn't know any rich people, so I had to start where I knew best and the people I knew best. And this is probably the most important message that I think I could bring tonight. You can't do planning without neighborhood, direct neighborhood involvement on a project by project basis. Just can't happen otherwise. And it, and it means developers, it's not developers bring their designs for you to say yay or nay. From the very get-go of designing that site, the people have to be involved. And there's no special magic to it. We develop all kinds of modeling kits for people to help people understand how to do site planning. You know, how do you get the open space, the parking solved, and getting the houses there and other land uses that you might have. And then later on, with bigger models, how do you design these houses to work for today's households? We heard all kinds of creative ways here tonight um, that far outstrip other places I've been to about ways of surviving on modest incomes. Uh, go ahead. Um, more examples of this participation. Another thing, shrinking the, all that area that's consumed by the car and the roads. And you have a good example here in North Boulder, that new development up there. Um, what was it called again? Holiday. Uh, nice, tight streets so that the streets are much more walkable, much more friendly. And if you're a driver going through there, you go really slow because everything's kind of tight. So people, people control their streets when that, when that shrinkage occurs. And I know the fire marshals, although his example, you know, Seattle historically had 25 foot curb to curb. They got new subdivisions now being created with almost the same amount. That one is down in Manhattan Beach, where 20 feet in, is the front drive and 20 feet is the back alley. Um, and the fire marshals learned to live with it. 
The problem is we have trucks here, unlike cars, we've now gone from down to much smaller size automobiles as a choice in the marketplace than we were just 15, 20 years ago. We haven't done that with our fire engines. <laughs> but other, other cities all over the world have you know, fire trucks that can fit those old streets of, of Europe. Uh, we don't have them. We have the SUVs of the fire truck business. And maybe we should be reconsidering that so we can make our tighter streets and make them more people friendly. Go ahead. Um, another uh, example of how to get a little more coziness with the single-family detached. There are communities where people really don't want to touch the neighbor with, with row houses. They want to do the single-family. So we were exploring ways of making sure that that could be done, but in a comfortable way, always pushing the garage all the way to the back so you don't see it from the street, right? The porch and the living spaces are up at the front. And you require that only half the house can be two stories. The other half has to be one story. So you don't get two-story masses next to two-story masses with only three or four or five-foot side yards. So it's a way of regulating it. And you get houses here that are up to 1,500 square feet. I mean, that's a pretty decent home. We heard a lot of it tonight about we should have smaller homes on smaller lots. Well, you know, that's exactly what we're doing here. And you get, you get uh, 10. Uh, per acre. The average size home in the United States in 1950 was 950 square feet. I mean, think about that. The average home now is 2,700 square feet. It's three times larger, yet 75% of the households in this country are one and two person households. Only 25% have kids. Now, they have 60% they have of the population within those 25% because they have the kids. But with 75% of ones and twos, why do we have these 2,700 square foot houses? Why not 900 like we had in 1950, you know? Wow. Mm. I thought I was going to have to t take the next plane out of here as soon as I was done. I'm, this is good. So here are examples of that, you know, modulating. You have two-story, one-story, porches only in the front. In this case, I think the cars were coming in through the alley um, as another way of making the fronts all landscape and softer and friendlier. Next. Um, a, a development that we did in Southern California, we, we're going to go up and up and up in the levels of coziness. This is 12 per acre. Low, this is a rental housing for very low and low income families. They're all three, four, and five bedroom units. This was all done through a community process. It was a Latino neighborhood in Southern California. And they went through that process of working with the models. They came up with their own site plan and their own house types. And they said, look, we don't want our houses touching each other. And when somebody in, in, in the workshops realized that the little one-story garages could be the spacers between the houses. So you don't get living space to living space. And you get a one, two, one, two story modulation. And this thing is twice the, the level of coziness as the surrounding neighborhood. But everybody loves it. And they accepted it. The other thing about it is six families per courtyard. So they all get to know each other. And they all know each other's kids and who belongs in there because there's only one way in and out. So anybody who's out to no good has to go out the way he came in. And so they don't go in, <laughs> you know? And the same is true with the street pattern. It's a U shape, but it actually has bollards at the base of the U. So you come into a dead end. The police and the fire can go through, but the, but the uh, residents each live on a dead end lane. And that was to keep out the drug dealers and the, and the cruisers. The lowriders. Next. So these are the friendly coordinates. We didn't have to put any gates because these were the gatekeepers. <laughs> when I came to photograph it, when we were finished, they prevented me from coming in. They said, who are you? <laughs> and I had to explain, well, I'm the architect, and I designed this thing. And they said, OK. They let me in, and I was able to photograph it. But the little subtle things about this housing, let's say, for example, this house. And this is a three-bedroom house that's 1,100 square feet. The four-bedroom houses were 1,300, and the five-bedroom houses were about 1,500 square feet. The two-bedroom, we didn't have any twos in this development, because uh, they were all good Catholic families, and they said, we're going to have a lot of kids, and we don't need any one- and two-bedroom units. So it's all three, fours, and fives. But the, the garage, the back end of the garage has a window in it facing onto the courtyard. So even when you're doing the laundry, you can watch what's going on in the courtyard. That's the living room. And the parents' bedroom on top of the garage has a deck so they can stand outside. If they hear anything going on, they can step outside 
and see what's going on. These are all lessons learned but from the tenements, by the way, and I'm just applying them to new circumstances. But the ability to look out your window and shout to your kids in the street was extremely important for maintaining the control over that street. And then the houses at the back end of the court moved forward so that the living rooms and the parents' bedrooms, again, could observe the street. And then the back courts, where the cars come in and out, is where the bigger kids play. They can work, you know, they can play ball games, and the little toddlers can play in the, in the small pedestrian courtyard. So it was a very successful, cohesive uh, uh, setting for families at this income level. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, another strategy single family house lots with three houses on them. Again, for very low income renters, that's a four bedroom house, that's a two bedroom house, and that's a four bedroom. 1,400 square feet, 900 square feet, 1,400 square feet, 3,700 square foot, looks like one of the big houses in the neighborhood. It's actually three households. And the four bedroom units have eight people living in them because they're families with, uh, with uh, uh, six kids. Or in this case, now we're up to 20 units, cozy units per acre. <clears throat> and this was housing for 16 units, one bedroom units, to made, made to look like a big house in the neighborhood, maybe in a bed and breakfast in. These were people who would be otherwise homeless. They've exhausted their, their um, savings, and they can't work. They have HIV um, AIDS. So this was a big deal to insert this into a, a neighborhood that was single family, suburban community. And the reason we were able to succeed is not so much the design helped a little bit, but a woman who literally was in her backyard came to the meeting where everybody came outraged that this was gonna be in the neighborhood and they all came from three, four, five blocks away. She lived right behind it. And she spoke basically and said, look, my son spent the last six, year, uh, six months of his life in such a place. I want this in my backyard. You can hear a pin drop. <laughs> I mean, even the priest who talked about the social services got booed. But when she spoke, as the real person who's in it, it's, you know, whose backyard it was in, spoke in favor of it, and from personal experience, it is passed. It, it got through and, and it got built. Go ahead. Um, another example, a suburban community, Redmond. Redmond, Microsoft country. Uh, they have homelessness. When there's a divorce, the woman usually ends up at the short end of the stick, and she's got the kids and no house, maybe a car. Um, so uh, this development was set up to help uh, these homeless families get reestablished. Um, at 20, I think this was 20 to the acre, or 22 to the acre. It even has a shelter for homeless, immediately emergency shelter on the second floor here. There are eight family units there, and then social services on the ground floor, and everybody here gets a two-story house while they're living here for two or three years to get their lives back in order. This was inserted comfortably into the suburban community and they love it. No one resisted, uh, re resisted the program. There's also a child care center and a, and a city park. Yeah, 22 to the acre. Some three stories, again, two story houses above one level flat. So the more the families um, feel like they're living in their own house and not in a series of stacked flats, the more they love it, the more they stay, the more they take care of it. Uh, the, oh yeah, Jingletown. This was a wonderful project. We worked with this neighborhood group that was fighting off a trucking company that wanted to use that lot and the one adjacent to it as a truck storage yard. So they organized and came to me, let's figure out another way to use this land and change the zoning. So they, they changed the zoning. It took a year and a half. And then with the modeling kits, they came up with this site plan of three auto pedestrian courts and then backyard courts that are pedestrian only, 18 units per court. And um, they also wanted the houses to be able to grow in place. So they're actually, the party wall is here and they're designed to allow them to expand into the attic. This was an unfinished attic and put the plumbing and the electrical stubbed out so they could add two more bedrooms and a bathroom up there. Again, another Catholic neighborhood, and so it was important that they grow in place and not have to be forced out with another bedroom above the living room. Go ahead. Yeah, there's the grow house, and here's a typical picture. That's the party wall. That's one house. This is another house, and these were unfinished attics, and we were able to get into the budget 
the stair up to the attic. It was, it was done during construction because we thought we couldn't afford it, and then we found we could afford it. So once the stair was put in, they move in with the opportunity to immediately press the attic into use, maybe as a play room, um, and eventually as two bedrooms and another bathroom up there. And then the, the, the um, driveways were set up to really be like pedestrian courts because we knew the kids would play there. This was a neighborhood group that was very upset with the fact that there was a drug dealing liquor store here. There was an abandoned gas station leaching into the soil. There was an underground creek here. No private developer would look at this land because of the, it was in three different jurisdictions, Oakland, uh, Emeryville, and this was owned by the county. And it's a little strip of land, so like a half an acre, so who would bother touching this thing? Uh, the neighborhood organized, went through that planning process, and came up with a solution. 17 homes, 11 of which would have at-home businesses on the main boulevard, and six of which, which aren't on the main boulevard, would have an accessory studio unit on the ground floor. So all of them had the potential to earn additional income to help them buy the houses. So these were for first-time buyers. Go ahead. <clears throat> so that's the street in the front. And because it's such a busy street, the front patio is walled in, but it has a window, so it's friendly to the street. But the noise level is kept down. And within short order, uh, you know, it has lots of hair. And then uh, the, each uh, unit that had the home-based business had a double height space. And here's the workspace outside with the protective wall and a half bath. And then some of them pulled all the way forward to the street edge, so they got an even bigger storefront or business front. There were um, 11 artists, a couple of photographers, and one a hair and nails shop, and one guy who said he was a, a bookkeeper. We don't know what kind of book he kept, but he was a bookkeeper. <clears throat> so then the back driveway is really set up as a pedestrian court. Being 30 feet wide, it allows us, allows us to stick trees in it that are only 20 feet apart, so the fire marshal would have its 20-foot uh, right-of-way. And then the creek area, above the creek, we just planted it with uh, vegetation that would be normally found on a creek side. And so it feels like you know the creek is down there. There was a, a grading, and I wanted to drop a microphone down to it as an art project and set up speakers here so that every time you walked by, you'd hear the creek below. <laughs> but the county wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> and, you know, these are the interiors. Those nice bucolic exteriors are also are housing people who are really working hard. And this was about uh, 35 dwelling units per, per acre. So we're, we're getting on up there, and they felt very comfortable. The neighborhood felt it fit the, fit the character of the neighborhood. And they loved the fact that uh, people were working there. Go ahead. Um, now here's an interesting one. This is 35 to the acre. <clears throat> but the reason for 35 to the acre, it's actually 35 to 50, wrapping around. So in order to make that six-acre park and restore the creek, the housing had to get cozier. So the neighborhood worked on this and figured out ways of, again, your townhouses above flats. This is a four-bedroom flat, and this is a five-bedroom townhouse. These are for large families uh, out in East Oakland. And this was the redo of a pub public housing project. So it's for very low-income folks and some middle-income, or what we call moderate income, 60% of AMI. Go ahead. And these are what the courtyards look like. You know, they're pretty comfortable for 35 to the acre. These are not scary numbers when you, when you see what's possible. And then the back courts where, are where the cars are. Go ahead. The courtyards are back here for the automobiles come in the back way. Go ahead. <clears throat> 40 dwelling units to the acre in Tacoma, hillside neighborhood right near the downtown. Townhouses, and this is, again, low-income rental housing. Two-story houses along the street here, above community facilities and some parking. And then two-story housing, wrapping these garages so you don't see them from the street. Two-story houses up there and some one-story flats for, for the uh, people who are in wheelchairs. So we get the density of coziness factor up there um, to 40 per acre. And it's really quite comfortable, go ahead. The neighborhood loved this thing and they wanted to see more of it. And this jump-started this 
the re revitalization of this neighborhood. Once a few of these were done by nonprofits and the Public Housing Authority, the private developers then came in and they're building it at slightly higher levels of coziness than this. And that's the central court at the midpoint in the slope of the hill. So people really get to know each other. It's only 30 feet apart, but um, it's still quite spacious. Um, these were getting up there. This is senior housing in a single family neighborhood in Puyallup, Washington, which is uh, maybe 45 minutes south of Seattle <clears throat> and not far from Tacoma. We restored a wetland in the back and the seniors love this thing. They said the only problem is that the frogs are so big and loud, they sound like cows at night. <laughs> and the people living on the ground floor said they, they, you know, it keeps them awake at night. But that was a comfortable architecture and level of coziness that the single family neighborhood is willing to do. It's for seniors, right? They need to stay in the community. This was in Redmond, also, you know, the Microsoft country. In the downtown, this was the first four-story building to be done in the downtown in the mid-1990s. So all one- and two-story buildings, and everyone was opposed to anything bigger than one or two stories. So <clears throat> when the YWC came in and said, we need housing for homeless women and children, so that was strike one <laughs> in the downtown. And then strike two was, and by the way, we have to do it in a four-story building because our land isn't very big. But by the time they were done in organizing, working with churches, schools, and other community organizations, everybody was in favor of it. And then once the building got done, it, was, it looked like a big resort lodge. It's not terribly expensive to build. And that changed the opinion of the planning commission and the city council. And now most of downtown Redmond is four to six stories tall. And this was the project they said convinced them that it was possible to have a cute, huggable apartment building uh, and, and not just be two stories. Okay. <clears throat> Palo Alto, Stanford country, college town, needs service workers whose incomes are very low. 50 dwelling units on one acre of land in the middle of what was called Professorville, where the houses are selling for two million plus. This is rental low-income rental housing, but made to feel like a lot of the houses in the neighborhood. Um, it's up a, about a third of a level out of the ground. The garage is two-thirds in the ground, one-third up. So it creates all these porches and stoops uh, along the street edge. And if you look at the plan, there's only a couple of places where you see a row on the street. You really see the ends, which look like single-family houses. Yeah, working with the neighborhood, with the modeling kits, people came up with this site plan about how to do it, and then we just give it the architecture, and it won lots of awards, and people in, in Palo Alto love it. They've got people, their servants living in the neighborhood. Um, 55 to the acre. This was an interesting neighborhood group who basically said, look, <clears throat> kids in elevator serve buildings mix too well. I mean, the kids deconstruct buildings. It's part of their job in life to figure out how everything works. So we don't want them in the elevators. We don't want them in the corridors or the fire stairs. So they said, in their modeling kids, they figured out you could put all these families, the three and four bedroom units, in the back in their own two-story houses. And then put all the one and two bedroom units, or all the ones and studios, some twos, in the elevator serve buildings in the front on the boulevard. So they zoned it so that the front buildings are about 75 to the acre and the back buildings are about 35 to the acre where the townhouses are. And so that's what um, generated the site plan. So the families live in these three and four bedroom units as two-story houses and the singles and couples are in the elevators for a building above the retail. There's retail, the childcare center, a community center, and a police substation on a major boulevard called International Boulevard we have 17 or 18 different language groups within the one building among the 92 families. And, oh, um, no way to go back. I forgot this little point. Um, on the retail, we recessed the windows back five feet with roll-down shutters for street vendors. Because we knew a lot of the families were immigrants. They came from cultures where street vending was the way of life. Why not give them a startup opportunity in the United States? and give them an alcove, five feet by 10 or 20. The rent is very low because it's 
basically unheated, unconditioned space. And when they're done at the end of the day, they just roll down the, the shutter. Yeah. Downtown Oakland. Now we're getting up to 90 units per acre because you're in the downtown. Families and formerly homeless singles and couples. The families got their own two-story houses on top of a childcare center and a retail uh, outlet store. And the singles and couples are on the top floor. This is a formerly homeless folks who were sleeping on the streets. They now got their own penthouses. And we gave them a roof deck so that they can, if they still want to sleep outside, they can do it on their roof. <clears throat> Grouping them in, into two smaller groupings, about 40 families in each courtyard, each with their own entrance and lobby. <clears throat> I mean, I think we're doing, we're, we've been succeeding at this because we worked with all those planning neighborhood groups through all those years. They taught me more than Harvard could ever teach me about how to do housing. And that's why we win all these awards, thanks to people like you, quite frankly. Go ahead. Uh, there's the courtyards on the inside. And then, and I think I had one more in here. Uh, well, this was a senior development in a neighborhood that was, you know, <coughs> infested with all kinds of drugs and gangs and, and drive-bys. Uh, it was called the Roaring Twenties in my neighborhood, East Oakland. And the nonprofit said, perfect, this is the place where you put senior housing. <laughs> because they have all this time to watch the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll call the cops when they see something happening that shouldn't be happening. So all the drug dealing just disappeared from anything within eyesight of this building. And we even gave them an outdoor deck here, protecting them from the winds with this glazing. It's, it's really a watchtower, because they, the they could see the whole neighborhood from up there. And then we gave them a crown to hide the solar voltaic you know, panels on the roof, and hired an artist to do all the glass work up in there, so it glows. It's that tiara. And then on the ground floor, uh, we planted it with vines you know, to soften the impact of what is essentially 65 units on two-thirds of an acre. So this is 100 dwelling units per acre. Courtyard on top of the parking garage and courtyard on the ground with all kinds of raised planters and fruit trees. And these are filled with vegetables now. Because again, seniors have the time to do that. And they want to do it. Go ahead. The last one. A Native American organization in Phoenix started out 40 years ago helping uh, alcoholic Native, Amer Native Americans who came to the cities, they were calling them urban Indians, were getting um, you know, remote from their reservations and their homelands without that cultural support, got addicted to alcohol. And so this center started to help Native Americans get off alcohol. And in the process over the 40 years, they got involved with all kinds of activities, including developing housing. And their attitude was, let the white people flee out to the suburbs. That's not the way to live in the desert climate in the 21st century. If you gotta live more sustainably. You gotta live more cozily, like we used to live in the cozy settlements that they had. Except this is a different kind of coziness now. This is 100 units to the acre, but we live right on a light rail line. Half a block from the light rail, right across the street from the high school. We wanna do a sustainable building. It's a lead platinum building with a modest construction budget. They were able to pull it off. They basically have through ventilation for the three bedroom units that are right at the play level. Then these are two story, three bedroom and two bedroom houses, just one flight away from the play. So all the families are closest to the play area. They all get through ventilation. And then the singles and couples are on the top floor. They have a central corridor, but they have vertical stack ventilation because they have double height living rooms. So they can ventilate the hot air out through the top and just open the windows. And then the courtyard itself that you see in the middle had east-west breezes. So that was well ventilated. And in the hottest days in the summer, you could still fear, feel the air flowing in it because it helps channelize it. So it was a pretty clever and fun operation working with them and, and Native Americans and the indigenous peoples showing the Anglos how they should be living in the 21st century. <laughs> Not out on the edge, but right at the heart, right on the light rail at 100 units to the acre. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with, with that story um, as a reminder of uh, who was here first.
Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Mike for coming and joining us tonight. We can do a couple questions. I just want to honor the fact that we're a little over time. Um, and I want to call out the fact that we've got, I know a lot of people won't be able to make it, but tomorrow uh, morning, Mike's graciously agreed that if we gave him some pastries, he would hang out. <laughs> no, protein bars, right. Um, at Alfalfa's community room uh, tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 11, correct? Uh, Mike will be available and we'll have pastries and coffee there. Anyone who wants to drop by and just engage in a more informal conversation with him, he's available then and we can take a couple questions now. cases, in all of these cases, we always seek a parking variance from what the normal requirements are for that location. And we can demonstrate from other past projects what the ownership ratio is of cars by people whose incomes are at 60% of the area median income and less. So we have demonstrable proof uh, that we're often at 0.7. And if you're close to a transit stop, we're down at 0.25 cars per per unit. So we've been able to successfully skirt around it. We're doing one right now, and right next to a BART station in the Fruitvale neighborhood. You may have seen the movie Fruitvale Village or, or whatever it was called, where the, the kid got shot by the, black kid got shot by the BART police. It's a famous location. So the, the, the parking lot that's there now is gonna become housing, and we're working on it right now. Affordable and market rate together on, on the same site. Zero parking was required. We're, we're supplying 0.5 for the affordable and 0.7 for the market, but none are really required. So they're putting less into housing to give them up, give them up and not the Yes, right. The housing is terribly wasteful, you know, cost, especially when you get to these higher levels of coziness. If you're talking about wanting a one car per unit, you're going to have a garage and it's probably going to be underneath and that's $25,000, $30,000 a car. It's crazy. You think? I turned 71 last month. Yeah, um, in a number of these developments, we'll be, we have raised planters, and they're growing their vegetables out of raised planters on rooftops or on top of a parking garage. Every one of the developments has that in some, in some form. Um, a good example right now is that Via Verde project in the Bronx. That's probably 200 units per acre, and that has rooftop raised planters for the families to, to grow food. But it's a big thing that's mentioned often with the community groups that we work with when they're designing these things is where we're going to grow the food because we're not going to have any real dirt left over because of the, the level of coziness that we need to achieve to make things financially feasible. So there are all kinds of ways of doing that on, on tops of the building, on the tops of the building. And that's something we used to do in Brooklyn. That whole song up on the roof, it's true. Everything Worthwhile in life took place on the roof. <laughs> There's another one. one more. In all those areas, they are zoned to permit those levels of coziness. A couple of times we had to get variances to, to raise it. But because the neighborhood was involved from the get-go in designing it, it was a piece of cake. Because they would support the change. They wanted the change because otherwise they couldn't get this housing to, to happen, to be affordable, to be the smaller units or the smaller driveways and all of that stuff took changes in the code. 
and they would come out and back it. And, and no elected official is going to fight the hand that feeds them, <laughs> votes for them. So that's how, in, in some instances, where we needed the variances, we got them. But in all of the cases, they were by right. But all of those boulevards that we design on are a half a block from, and they were backed up against, single-family detached neighborhoods. So we had to find ways of scaling down. And the one that I showed you that had the boulevard building with the smaller houses in the back, I mean, that was partly to serve the needs of the families, but it was also partly to serve the need of the neighborhood to scale down the project as it butted up against the backyards and houses of, of, of the neighborhood. Now, if you got neighborhood involvement, you got, and they're really helping to shape the design, the support is there. And the few naysayers, I remember a church group that we were working with. Actually, it wasn't a church group. It was a nonprofit. We held our meetings in the local church so that the naysayers wouldn't use obscenities when they were arguing with us. Because <laughs> the pastor was right there, and it was on his premises, so people would be civil. And there were still some people who really did not like the idea that uh, 60 seniors were going to be living on this parcel that used to be a series of single-family homes. And the rest of the congregation would look at these guys and, and basically um, uh, marginalize them. Because, look, this made sense. It's for seniors. It's for people on low income. They need a place to live. It's being designed by them. They got all the, the things they wanted in the design to fit the neighborhood. And the naysayers just um, got marginalized. You know? But it helps to start out in a faith-based organization. People are nicer. <laughs> Like this. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Sure. And uh, it reminds me, I want to thank E-Town for letting us use this wonderful facility of theirs tonight. <laughs> we, are, we are hoping to have this uh, conversation go forward in a way in which nobody's marginalized. Um, but really, this is the beginning of a conversation. I want to encourage everyone to stay involved. I want to thank you a ton for coming out tonight and spending your time in this meeting. Um, I want to call out, there's a few council members here tonight, uh, Macon and Lisa and who else? Mary um, and planning board members. Um, so uh, this is a conversation between community members, between community members and our council and planning board and staff. Uh, it's important. We had an all-day council retreat on Saturday. We talked a lot about this initiative and sort of affirmed that the council think this is a really important thing for us to devote a lot of time and effort to in the coming months, so we're going to be doing that. Um, we're thinking there's going to be an opportunity for us to go out and learn about some of the great designs that are here in Boulder itself. I think a lot of people in our community don't even really know the full extent of some of our own uh, affordable housing that's been built, uh, opportunities we had talked, uh, one of the co-ops would love to invite people to go and see their co-op and understand what it's about. So just an opportunity to learn about what we've done and what should we do more of or what are the things that we might pick up from folks like Mike that would make sense here in Boulder. Um, but again, thanks a ton. Stay in touch. Housingboulder.net is the place to sign up to be on the email. In about five to six weeks, we'll be having the rapid fire. So if you've got some ideas brewing, that'll be your chance to put them out to the audience. Um, and we'll take it forward. Thanks very much. <laughs>